You have your Bibles with you. Yes. Lift it up. Say, this is my Bible. I am who it says I am. I have what it says I have. I can do what it says I can do. I'll never, never, never doubt this word because it is the word of faith. Say, I've got ears to hear. Hard to receive. Teach to me the word of God. Say, I believe it. I receive it right now into my life in Jesus' name. John chapter 11, we talked about it on Sunday, deals with the resurrection of Lazarus, what Jesus did in the life of Lazarus. Lazarus come forth, he came forth from the dead. Powerful, powerful passage of Scripture. And I want to finish up that chapter tonight because there are tremendous opposing forces that are illustrated in that remaining part of that chapter and the beginning of chapter 12. And as believers, I think it's so important to understand not only what was going on back then, because we see a lot of what was going on back then playing out today. Nothing's changed. The devil is still the devil. Come on, I need good, good amens on this Wednesday night. The devil is still the devil. And things are pretty much the way they were way back when. And so I think we get tremendous uh, keys to understanding that we can operate in the same manner that the early church was operating in and walk in victory in our life. Somebody say amen. amen. And amen. So I want to read a little bit of scripture to you to illustrate some things. So look with me in John 11, verse 45, and we'll read to the end, and then we'll pick up a few uh, verses at the beginning of John 12. John 11, 45, Then many of the Jews who had come to Mary and had seen the things that Jesus did believed in Him. Say, I'm a believer. I'm a believer. Say, I'm a believer. I'm a believer. Amen. Verse 46, but some of them went away to the Pharisees and told them the things Jesus did. So you see a dichotomy right there. You see a division right there. Many believed, but many went away. Many believed, but many went away. Nothing much has changed, right? <laughs> In this day and age, many believe, many don't believe. But I'm glad I'm a part of the believers, aren't you? Because I'm going to live forever and ever with the Lord. They're going to be responsible for their lives. I took responsibility for my life, and I gave my life to the Lordship of Jesus Christ. I wish I'd done it earlier, but I did do it. Glory to God. Amen. So many believed, but many went away. Verse 47. Then the chief priests and the Pharisees gathered a council and said, What shall we do? For this man works many signs. Now you would think they would say, let's celebrate. Messiah has come. What shall we do? Let's celebrate, praise God. We see the signs of the Messiah. We see the prophecy being fulfilled. This is what we've been waiting for. This is what we've been teaching about. But that's not what they said. That is not the direction they went in. Verse 48. If we let this man alone like this, everyone will believe in him. And the Romans will come and take away both our place and nation. You see, what they were worried about was their position, was their power, was their title, was their prestige, was their rank in the community, was their standing in the nation. And they said, if this man continues unhindered, everybody is going to believe in him, Rome is going to be upset with us, and come and take away that which we prize. You know where your heart is? That's where your treasure is at. And their treasure was in their position. Their treasure was in their title. Come on, church. Their treasure was in their standing in their community and not their standing in the Lord. Uh, not their relationship with the Lord. Uh, politics have not changed. Nothing has changed. They just want to hang on to power, hang on to position. Uh, come on. And they're willing to kill to do it. Now watch this. 
watch this, Rome will come and take away our place and our nation, verse 49. Then one of them, Caiaphas, being high priest that year, said to them, Do you know nothing at all, nor do you consider that it is expedient for us that one man should die for the people and not the whole nation should perish? we got to kill this guy. It's better for us if he dies uh, than we lose the nation to Rome. Well, Rome already had the nation. (laughs) I said Rome already had the nation. They were servient to Rome. If they'd just gone with the Messiah. Come on now. It's expedient for us. It's better for us if this man should die. Now, verse 51 Now this he did not say on his own authority, but being the high priest, he prophesied that Jesus would die for the nation. Verse 52. And not the nation only, but also that he would gather together in one the children of God who are scattered abroad. Then from that day on they plotted to put him to death. They wanted to kill him because he was more influential than they were. They wanted to kill him because he had more power than they had. They wanted to kill him because he had more favor with the people than they had. They wanted to kill him because he was going to upset the apple cart. They wanted to kill him because if the people went after him, Rome would go after them. They liked it the way it was. They had their position. They had their power. Rome approved of them, but he was in the way. Jesus had influence and power and authority that they did not have, so the solution was kill him. They plotted to kill him. They wanted to kill him because they didn't like him. They wanted to kill him because he was more influential. They wanted to kill him because the people liked him more than they liked them. So what's the answer? Kill him. Kill him. That's what we'll do. We'll kill him. Let's come up with a plot to put him to death. That was the national religious ruler's response to the ministry of Jesus Christ. That was the powerful response to the Messiah. He did miracles. We don't care. Raised the dead. We don't care. Fed the 5,000. We do not care. Delivered people of devils. Don't care. He's messing with our power. He's messing with our position. He's messing with Rome. Let's kill him. Isn't that incredible? Don't you find that remarkable? But nothing has changed. I said nothing has changed. There are politicians that will plot the same thing against their enemies. Find a way to destroy them. Find a way to kill them, politically speaking. Because you got to hang on to power at all costs. Isn't that true? The authority... And the influence of Jesus Christ in the world today faces great opposition. It's no different than the opposition Jesus faced in his day. They were plotting his death. Secular society is plotting the death of the church. There's nothing they would like better than to silence the church, destroy the church, disband the church. What do you hear in the news? We have to disband the patriarchy. That's that's just talking about the Bible. That's talking about the church, the patriarchy. The Bible is a dangerous book. Come on, it's been banned from libraries. Did you know that? Because it's a dangerous book. Preaching the gospel of Jesus Christ is hate speech. Society is gathered against the gospel, is gathered against the church, is gathered against the believer. Why? Because Jesus Christ has influence. He still has influence. He's still raising people up. He's still delivering people. He's still healing people. He still is the only answer for the sin-sick soul. And it drives them crazy. It drives them crazy. And they say, the only expedient thing to do is to get rid of these believers. 
is to crush these believers, is to crush the church of Jesus Christ. Nothing has changed. But I like what the believers did. I like what Jesus' friends were doing. While the religious rulers were plotting his death, his friends were celebrating him at dinner. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. I say the more that they plot our demise, I say the more we should celebrate. The more they tell us to be quiet, the louder we should get. They saw Jesus as a nation changer. We are nation changers. They saw Jesus as a world changer. We are world changers. There's more power in the gospel of Jesus Christ than anything that's ever been written by secular society. There's more power in the spirit of the Holy Ghost than anything those politicians can come up with. Yeah, they want to quiet us. I say, let's celebrate him. Let's celebrate the lordship of Jesus Christ. Hallelujah. So in John 12, we see in the close of John 11 that the religious rulers of the day are plotting his death. Plotting his death. This is a week before the crucifixion. Plotting his death. Now in John 12, six days before the Passover or the crucifixion, Jesus came to Bethany where Lazarus, who, who had been dead, whom he had raised from the dead. Now, Mary and Martha, brother Lazarus, or a family, their father was probably Simon the leper. This dinner is going to take place in his house, the house of Simon the leper, if you read some of the parallel translations or, or, or gospels. And Jesus had healed, most likely, Simon the leper, or nobody would have been having dinner at his house. <laughs> you don't go have dinner at the leper's house unless he's been healed. And so Simon the leper had been healed by Jesus, we assume, and this is why Mary and Martha would have approached Jesus when their brother Lazarus was sick, saying, if you come, we know he can be healed. Why? Because they saw their father healed by Jesus in all likelihood. And so they're in Bethany. That's where their home is, where Lazarus, who had been dead, been raised from the dead. Verse 2. And there they made him a supper. Martha served. Lazarus was one of those who sat at the table with him. And Mary took a pound of very costly oil, spikenard, anointed the feet of Jesus, wiped his feet with her hair, and the house was filled with the fragrance of the oil. W what a time of celebration. What a time of worship. She was absolutely worshiping. What a devout person. She took the very best that she had, the most costly thing in the house, and she anointed his feet, and using her own hair, wiped, it, wiped his feet with her hair, and it filled the house. Everybody experienced the worship. It's like, to me, it's like church. When I read this, I'm reading church. This is a church service where the anointing fills the atmosphere of the house of God. The worship fills the atmosphere. The, the praise is poured out and, and as we just cast ourselves at the feet of Jesus Christ. And so, verse 4, one of the disciples, Judas Iscariot. Now, Judas, mercy, mercy, mercy. Judas, you know, the devil comes to steal and kill and destroy. It was the religious rulers who wanted to kill Jesus. And it was Judas who wanted to steal from Jesus. Jesus had national problems with the leaders. He had problems within the deep state, his own circle. Judas there wanted to steal from him. And Judas, Simon's son, a different Simon, would, would betray him, said, Why is this fragrant oil not sold for 300 denarii and given to the poor? This he said, not that he cared for the poor, but because he was a thief and had the money box. So Judas was the banker. He was the treasurer for the ministry of Jesus Christ. That is not <laughs> the person you want overseeing your treasury. And he used to take. He used to take what was put in it. He stole from Jesus. 
man, did he see Jesus raise Lazarus from the dead? Yeah. Did he see Jesus heal Simon the leper? Yes. Did he see Jesus feed the 5,000, feed the 4,000, walk on the waters, speak to the stormy seas, peace be still? Did he see all these things? Yes, 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 yes. It had no bearing on him because he wanted the money. He loved the money. He loved the money more than he loved Jesus. And he stole from him. He was a thief. He used to take what was put in him. And verse 7, Jesus said, now, so, Jesus, so Judas is railing against this, this whole situation. She's worshiping. And you can tell she is in a state of worship. She has anointed his feet with this costly anointing oil. She's using her hair to, to dry his feet, to wipe his feet. And here's old Judas. What are you doing? This is crazy. Why would you do that? We could have sold that, gotten the money, given it to the poor. Uh, religious folks act very religious, but it's just to cover their own heart, their own sinful nature. He's, what he's saying is, if she had just given it to me, I would have sold it, taken that money, and given it to the poor. But we know only a fraction of that money would have ended up with the poor. The rest of it would have gone into the Judas Retirement Fund. <laughs> Isn't that true? Because he was a thief. And he was a steal. He stole from Jesus. Don't steal from Jesus. Oh, <laughs> my goodness. Jesus said, let her alone. Leave her alone. Let her alone. She's kept this for the day of my burial. She's got a revelation that no one else has. She is anointing him for burial. He raised her brother, and she's anointing him for his death. The poor you'll always have with you. In other words, you can minister to the poor anytime. There'll be more opportunities to minister to the poor. Endless opportunities to minister to the poor. But me, you do not always have. So my time's coming to a, to a close. The poor, you're going to have plenty of opportunities to minister to them. But ministry to me is, is over in six days. I'm going to be crucified soon. Hallelujah. So in these two passages that we took time to read, what we see here is the uh, opposing forces uh, clashing together as things are crescendoing, coming to a head just before the crucifixion of Jesus Christ. On a national level, you hear the religious rulers plotting his death because of his influence and his power and his authority. So it's expedient. We have to put him to death. So on a national level, they see him as a nation changer. They're threatened, so they want to kill him. The response of the people to that, of the church to that, is to celebrate him. And Mary did so with the, with the weeping and the anointing and the wiping with her hair. So they're plotting death, and the church is plotting celebration. Glory to God. I say, let's celebrate. Hallelujah. <laughs> what a time that would have been. What a party that would have been. What, they say at the table, Lazarus was sitting right there. The guy that had been dead. Uh, wouldn't you love to hear that dinner conversation? <laughs> wouldn't you love to ask him, what was it like? What was it like? What was it like? Where were you for those four days? What was going on? Hallelujah. What did you see? Hallelujah. What was it like? Glory to God. What a great dinner conversation. And Simon had been healed. Hallelujah. And what, a, what a time it would have been. That house would have been filled with people with testimonies you, that would just had kept you up all night listening to those testimonies. Glory to God. So on a national level, they're plotting death and they're celebrating. But on, a, on an individual level, on a personal level, Judas is plotting thievery. And Mary is being so generous in giving the, the best and, and the most that she has to anoint Jesus. What she had was the anointing oil that was worth a year's wages. A year's wages. Tens of the, in today's terms, uh, I looked up what the, 
the average income for an American is uh, now, and uh, it's fifty, sixty thousand dollars or something a year. And so that oil was worth tens of thousands of dollars. Tens of thousands of dollars. And she used it in one moment, at one time, to anoint the feet of the Lord. And Judah said, what a waste. The world is going to tell you your praise is a waste. The world is going to tell you serving Jesus is a waste. The world is going to tell you going to church is a waste. The world is going to tell you that tithing is a waste and giving of your time is a waste and dedicating your life to, to the Lord is a waste. A waste, a waste, a waste, they say. There's better things that you can do with it. But let me tell you, she used it to the best of her ability to honor the Lord. And Jesus said, you leave her alone. She's preparing me for my next step of ministry. The cross. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. She got it. And you get it. And we get it. And the church of Jesus Christ gets it. Those outside the, the, the faith, they don't get it. But they sure are critical of us. But they don't get it. I said they don't get it. The faithful gathered to celebrate Jesus. All those who were touched by Jesus were there together on that day. The disciples were there. The healed of Jesus were there, gathered at the dinner table. Martha was serving them. Hallelujah. To me, it just reminds me of church service, where we all get together. We've all been touched by Jesus, and we're going to eat the bread of life. We're going to worship. We're going to pour our anointing out on the feet of Jesus, which is our worship and our praise. And then we're going to pull our chair up to the banquet table, and we're going to eat the word of life, hallelujah, and dine on the bread of life. Glory to God. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Now, the early church understood that their faith in Jesus put them in direct opposition to the structure of the day, the power holders of the day. And when Peter and John healed the man at the gate beautiful, they were rebuked for it. They were arrested for it. You know they're arresting people for the faith now? Did you realize that? They're arresting people for the faith now. They're arresting people for speech now. They're arresting people for our faith in Christ now and how we raise our children now. I won't go into the details, but they are. You know, you've read the headlines. They are. The early church realized that we have one response to their opposition to us, and that is to get before the Lord get the anointing on our lives, and become more bold than ever before. Now, when Peter and John were arrested, and they were threatened, and they were told to be quiet, don't you ever talk about Jesus ever again, they went back to church. They went back to where they were celebrating Jesus. And they shared with the people in Acts 4 and 23. It says, they went to their companions and reported all that the chief priests and the elders had said to them. The very ones that had crucified Jesus. And what did the, what did the, what did the church do? The church realized uh, that there is going to be a perpetual friction between religiosity and spirituality. Come on. Look, look in verse 25. They said, Who by the mouth of your servant David said, Why do the nations rage and the people plot vain things? The kings of the earth took their stand and the rulers who were gathered together against the Lord and against His Christ. I know we want to get along with everybody. I know we would like for everybody to like us. I know that we would like for everybody to celebrate the gospel of Jesus Christ. But it's just not going to happen. And if they're going to get tough, we got to get tough. And if they're going to rage... 
the nation rage and the people plot vain things and the kings of the earth gather together against the Lord and against his Christ. Okay, if that's what they're going to do, what are we going to do? Well, I'll tell you what they did. They lifted up their hearts to the Lord and they started praying to the Lord, give us more boldness so that we can pray for folks to be healed and the Holy Ghost fell upon them and the room was shaken where they were praying because God said, you want boldness? I'll give you boldness. If they're going to rage against you, I'll give you boldness to preach the gospel of Jesus Christ. Hallelujah. 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 Paul, one man, defeated the religious structure of the day. One man defeated Rome himself. Oh, Rome thought that they could take his head. They could take his head, but they could not stop his message. We're still preaching his message. We're still preaching his message to this day. And, and what did Paul say in Ephesians 6? Be strong in the Lord. And in the power of his might, put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against what? The wiles of the devil. The devil hasn't gone away. And his trickery has not gone away. And his methodology has not gone away. Because he steals and he kills and he destroys. That's his MO and it hasn't changed. So what do we in the church have to do? Stand. Stand. Be strong in the Lord and in the power of His might that you may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. We don't wrestle against flesh and blood, he says, but we do wrestle against powers and principalities, rulers of darkness of this age, against spiritual hosts of wickedness in heavenly places. Yeah, the battle's on, church. The battle is raging and the battle is on. I, I, just, I just go back to it, and I just love it. That while they were raging against Jesus, Jesus was having supper with his friends. They were selling. All the healed folks got together. All the happy folks got together. All the worshiping folks got together and had dinner. Yeah. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Verse 13, take up the whole armor of God that you may be able to withstand in the evil day, having done all to stand. Skipping down to verse 18, praying always with all prayer and supplication in tongues, in the Spirit, in tongues. Everybody say in tongues. I'm Pentecostal. How about you? I pray in tongues. How about you? I worship in the Spirit. How about you? I'm thankful for the Pentecostal experience, aren't you? I'm thankful that I'm born again. I'm thankful that I am a Pentecostal, Spirit-filled believer. And I worship in the Spirit. And I pray in the Spirit. Come on. And, and I'm about to preach in the Spirit. Glory to God. Thank God for the Holy Ghost. And thank God. Listen. Paul said, pray in the Spirit. Pray in tongues for me. That utterance may be given to me. That I, as an ambassador in chains. That I may speak boldly as I ought to speak. What's your point, Pastor? I'm saying if they're going to get bold, we need to get bold. And if they're going to rage against Jesus, we need to celebrate Jesus. And if they're going to plot the death of the church of Jesus Christ, and good, look, good luck with that because Jesus said, I will build my church. There's nothing they can do to prevent the building of the church of Jesus Christ. Now, there's a lot of churches that are willing to get along and go along, but, but I say, no, let's just stick to the Word. Let's just do it the way Jesus did it. Stick to the mission. Stick to the Word. Hallelujah. What do you do when the nation is coming against you? Hey, can I let you in on a secret? The nation is coming against us. The nation is opposed to the gospel of Jesus Christ. So we need to make a stand and you have to know who you are in Christ. 
you got to know what your core values are. you got to know your identity in Christ and then make a stand and don't quit. Glory to God. Someone say, praise the Lord. you got to know what your mission is in Christ. What am I doing to further the cause of Christ? Then make a stand and then don't quit. Glory to God. you got to know who your allies are in Christ. We have great allies. we got the Holy Ghost. We got the church, we got the word, we got angels, hallelujah. We got faith, glory to God. Then make a stand and don't quit, hallelujah. You got to know who your enemy is. Make a stand and don't quit. Come on. You got to know what kind of legacy, what kind of witness you want to leave behind. uh, And then make a stand and don't quit. Make a stand. Turn to your neighbor and say, make a stand. Turn to your other neighbor and say, don't quit. quit. There's no quitting in the body of Christ. There's no quitting in the faith. There's no quitting in the Holy Ghost. Make a stand. Just plant your feet right now and make a stand. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Make a stand. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. The nation raged against him, and that did not sway him one bit. And that did not sway the church one bit. Judas sought to steal from him, and that did not sway him one bit. Leave her alone, Jesus said. She's preparing me for burial. And I'm going to go to that cross, Judas. And you know what I'm going to do, Judas, before I get to that cross? I'm going to wash your feet like she's anointing my feet and washing my feet with her hair. Judas, at the Last Supper, I'm going to wash your feet. And then from the cross, I'm going to speak forgiveness over everybody. Come on, hallelujah. Hallelujah. Jesus did not take a grudge with him to heaven. He left it all on the cross. Father, forgive them. They don't know what they're doing. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. 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 Judas's betrayal did not surprise Jesus. Don't be surprised when you get the Judas kiss. Don't be surprised because betrayal is part of the plot of our demise. They got to get close and then there's betrayal. But don't let it take you down. I said, don't let it take you down. Jesus said, go do what you got to do. Just go do what you got to do. I'll do what I got to do. You go do what you got to do. And then Judas came back with the troops, kissed him. Judas, you betray me with a kiss? Betrayal is always with a kiss. That's the way it is. Kiss on the cheek and knife in the back. That's, that's the way it works. That's the way it works. But we're believers. And that does not destroy us, finish us, dissuade us. Or stop us. Just let those people go on and do what you got to do. But I'm going to do what I've got to do. And that's worship the king. Worship the king. I'm, I'm so captured by the thought that Judas was rebuking Mary for falling on her knees and anointing his feet and then washing it with her hair. And just days later, that same Judas would be sitting in the chair and Jesus would be on his knees washing his feet and drying it with the towel wrapped around his feet. Isn't that powerful? That's the love of God. That's the love of God. Hallelujah. That's a good place to break right there. Did you get anything out of this tonight? Hallelujah. Hallelujah. The 